Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right, Today, we're going to be talking about Frankie Yale, the Robin Hood of Brooklyn. Now, for those members who've been around for a while, you guys know that I did Frankie a while back, but it got removed. So now I want to do it again. I got a lot more info on Frankie, and I didn't have to use any books. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to start redoing some of those old videos again, and this is the first. But if you've seen the original... I suggest watching this one too, because based on some new info I have, I've corrected a few things. All right, so let's get into this. Francesco Iwali was born April 13th, 1893, in the slums of Rigi Calabria on mainland Italy, to Domenico and Isabella Iwali. Frankie was the second of four children born in Italy. Another son, Angelo, would be born after Domenico moved the family to the U.S. to escape the mafia. The family was settled in the Italian neighborhood on the Lower East Side. Domenico soon realized that the Mafia had beaten him to America. He got a job on the East River docks and received his citizenship in 1908. Young Frankie never became a citizen, and soon he fell victim to the streets of the Lower East Side. In 1903, Domenico saw that his son was on the wrong track. He made him a shoeshine box and sent him out to make some legal money. There was no way to know that this would send Frankie on a path that would eventually cost him his life. One of Frankie's customers, was a 20-year-old gang leader named Little Johnny Torrio. Johnny would often give young Frankie 10 bucks for a shoe shine, a fortune for a poor kid. This was probably more than his father made in the whole month. Frankie idolized Torrio and wanted to be just like him. So at 13, Frankie joined the Five Points Juniors and began his criminal education. At 15, he was graduated to the Five Points Seniors after he assisted in the murder of a rival. It was around this time when Francesco Iwali started going by Frankie Yale. In 1909, Johnny Torrio moved to Chicago to become the right-hand man of Big Jim Colosimo, one of Chicago's biggest dealers of flesh and husband of Johnny's cousin. Big Jim was having problems with some black hand gangsters who were extorting him. A few months after Johnny arrived in Chicago, several black handers lost the ability to draw breath. Before he left for Chicago, Johnny introduced Frankie to a chubby 10-year-old named Alphonse Capone. Frankie took young Alphonse under his wing and tutored him like Johnny had tutored him. On February 26, 1912, 19-year-old Frankie boarded a train. Frankie was not on his best behavior. Him and his friends were acting rowdy and causing a scene. He got into an argument with the fair collector when he was told to keep it down and the police were summoned. When the cops arrived, they arrested Frankie for using profanity in the presence of passengers. He was sentenced to 10 days in the city jail and fined 10 bucks. On June 20, 1913, Frankie and his boys went out for a night of bowling and billiards. He would end his night in jail. They made their way to a bowling alley in the basement of a hotel on Coney Island. Sometime after midnight, Frankie and his boys got rowdy and the police were called. When the cops arrived, they were met with bowling balls, pool sticks, and pool balls. Frankie and his boys barricaded themselves into the basement until reinforcements arrived and took them into custody. Frankie Yale, Andrew Barbara, Frank Morano, and Ernest Gortoni were arrested and held on $500 bail. Frankie and Barbara were also charged with the assault and robbery of Alexander Matarasso in his dry goods store the day before. Matarasso identified the pair as the ones who assaulted him and swore to an affidavit charging him with the crime. But when the trial started, he had a different story. He said that he was sure that it wasn't Yale and Barbara that assaulted him. He was immediately arrested and charged with perjury. It's probably better to do a few days in jail than eternity in a coffin. On July 31st, 1913, Frankie and his friend Michael Petro were arrested for robbery in the first degree. They would be found guilty, and Frankie was sentenced to Sing Sing. When he got back out, he was almost sent right back in on a longer stretch. A saloon keeper was robbed of his watch and gold chain. When he resisted, his jaw was broken. Frankie Yale, Michael and Tony Gregoria, and Philip Spain were arrested and stood trial. Frankie was looking at 20 years if convicted. But again, Frankie was released when the witness changed his story. He said it was only the Gregoria brothers who robbed him. The two brothers pled guilty and were sentenced to 20 years. Frankie Yale and Philip Spain went free. By 1915, Frankie was living in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn with his family. His parents were disappointed to find out that their son was a gangster. But Frankie didn't hide his lifestyle. He opened the Harvard Inn, a dance hall and saloon on Coney Island. It quickly became a place where Brooklyn's toughest guys came to get a drink and he hired 15-year-old Alphonse Capone to be a bouncer. Frankie also started the Yale Taxi Corporation with his brother Angelo, and they had 125 cars on the street. As a person who helped a lot of men into the grave, 
Frankie thought that an opening in the funeral home would be convenient. He also assembled a small army and used them to break strikes. He organized the bricklayers and wrestled control over laundry unions and demanded protection from neighborhood shop owners. He even had a line of cheap cigars called the Frankie Yale. On October 6, 1915, police were tipped off that gambling was taking place in a coffee house at 1255 60th Street. The cops busted the door down and found Frankie and 42 other Italian men engaged in crap games. They confiscated several black jacks and razors and took the 43 men in two patrol wagons and a commandeered touring car to the 4th Avenue station, where they were arraigned before a magistrate and held for sentencing. There's no information on what became of that, so I assume that he was released or hit with a fine. On August 10th, 1916, Frankie became a made man in the Navy Street Gang, one of the three Italian gangs that ran New York. The Brooklyn-based Navy Street Gang controlled the docks, gambling, extortion, labor rackets, and prostitution. It was a hectic time in the underworld of New York. There was no boss of bosses. The Italian underworld was controlled by three gangs, one based in Manhattan, known as the Mulberry Street Gang, one based in Harlem, known as the 116th Street Gang or the Uptown Gang, and one in Brooklyn, called the Brooklyn Crew or the Navy Street Gang. Now, the Navy Street Gang was not mafia. They were not Sicilian. They were mostly from Naples, mainland Italy, and they had their own criminal tradition, and it was called the Camorra. By 1916, a war had been going on for a few years between the Sicilian Mafia and the Camorra. On September 7, 1916, Harlem boss Nicholas Terranova was killed as he walked out of a meeting with the Navy Street Gang. This would be the latest killing in a struggle that would end up in Joe Masseria becoming the boss of bosses. But that's for another video. In January of 1917, Al Stern, a self-employed chauffeur from Bay Ridge, stole $320 from Yale associate Thomas Anthony. Stern was sent several death threats and he decided to call the cops. On February 1, 1917, officers received a call that men led by Frankie Yale were in the Utrecht Street address getting ready to make an attack on Al Stern. When detectives arrived at the building, they found the door locked. They went around to the side of the building and they found Frankie along with five other guys trying to escape out the side. They forced the men back inside and found two loaded pistols. The men were arrested and Frankie was charged again with possessing a weapon. The first grand jury found him innocent, but the DA knew how bad Frankie was and brought him back in front of a new grand jury with more evidence and Frankie was found guilty and sent back to prison. In 1919, Al Capone was ducking a murder charge in Brooklyn. He hid in the basement of the aunt of a childhood friend named Ben Siegel. Maybe you heard of him. He stayed for a few days before arrangements could be made for him to head out to Chicago to work for Johnny Torrio. When Frankie got out in 1919, Prohibition had just begun, and Frankie wasted no time transitioning from an extortionist to a bootlegger. He began to buy booze, probably from the fleet of ships off the coast that sold booze from international waters known as Rum Row. But I'm not sure. Out in Chicago, Johnny Torrio was the number two man in Big Jim Colosimo's operation, and he saw Prohibition as a way to get rich. But his boss was already rich, and he was happy with the money he made off of selling flesh. So Johnny took it upon himself to make a change in the organization, starting at the top. He made a call to Brooklyn, and the next day, Frankie Yale was on the train headed for the Windy City. On the morning of May 12, 1920, Johnny Torrio called Big Jim Colosimo and told him that he needed to be at his restaurant to pick up a delivery. Johnny said that something came up and he couldn't make it himself. Big Jim sighed. He had planned on spending the rest of the day in bed with his new 20-something-year-old wife. When he arrived at his restaurant, only the manager was there. Big Jim walked to the rear of the restaurant and shots rang out. The manager heard two shots and called the police. When they arrived, they searched the restaurant and found the body of Big Jim Colosimo with two extra holes in his head. Frankie was on a train back to Brooklyn. On the evening of February 6, 1921, Frankie was at the Dwayne Field Club at 158 Park Road, Brooklyn for dance night. Some of Frankie's enemies had the same plans. The two parties clashed in the hallways and the fruckers spilled into the streets. Harsh words turned to shoves, shoves turned to fists, and then shots rang out. Members of both groups opened fire on each other. Beat cops heard the shots and came running in, sending the gangsters scattering in all directions. One of the men only made it a few steps before collapsing across the street. Michael Demetchi, a dock worker, was taken to the hallway of the club where he died from a bullet to the heart. Police found numerous pistols and sent notice for all local hospitals to be on the lookout. An hour later, Frankie Yale was carried into the Broad Street Hospital with a bullet in his left lung. He told the police that he was just walking past the dance and was caught in a crossfire. The cops had nothing on Frankie, 
So after the doctors patched him up, Frankie was back on the streets. On June 7th, the body of Ernesto Melchiori was found outside the Harvard Inn. He had been stabbed to death and his head was removed from his body. Frankie Yale and Pasquale Griffo, an 85-year-old, were arrested, but were released due to lack of evidence. Around 3 a.m. on July 15, 1921, Frankie was in the car along with his brother Angelo, private detective Robert Lawrence, Babe Canale, and Anthony Cassano, known as Little Augie Paisano. They were in the car returning from the Harvard Inn. As they reached Bay 21st and Cropsley Avenue, a car pulled alongside and shots rang out. 45 caliber slugs tore into the car, wounding Angelo and Robert. The shooter hit the gas and pulled off. But a bike cop saw the shooting and gave chase on his bike. He followed the car up Cropsley Avenue to Bay 22nd Street and then along 18th Avenue to 86, where he ditched his bike and commandeered a car from a parking garage and continued to chase. But his car could not keep up with the shooters and they escaped. A few days later, Silvio Melchiori, the older brother of Ernesto, was telling people he was going to get even with the men who killed his brother. On July 23rd, 1921, Silvio was in his cafe at Kenmar and Elizabeth Street in Manhattan. At around 8.30 a.m., he was summoned outside by an unknown man. Silvio was talking to the man in front of the cafe. Distracted by the conversation, he did not see the man walking up behind him, and then shots rang out. The second man pumped five shots into his body. The two men split up and disappeared into the crowd, leaving Silvio to die. Frankie Yale and little Augie Paisano were arrested, but released due to lack of evidence. It seems that the Melchiori brothers' deaths were a favor. Silvio was in Joe Masseria's territory, and he may have been in his way. Not long after this murder, Frankie Yale and Anthony Carfano joined Joe the Boss Masseria's organization. In December 1922, Cole was in short demand in Brooklyn due to the incompetence of Cole administrator Samuel Drummond. Frankie made sure that the residents of his neighborhood would not freeze, and he donated 12 tons of coal. His philanthropy did not stop there. Frankie helped to build schools, gave money and gifts during the Christmas holidays, and was available to help neighborhood families whenever they were in need. Some nights, Frankie would come home with nothing in his pockets because he gave it all away to the needy. He was a political leader in the Brooklyn Democratic Club, and he was a friend to the boys in blue. Anytime a cop needed help financially, he could count on Frankie. That was probably a good investment for Frankie. Frankie was now a real force in Brooklyn, and he had some future mafia superstars under his command. Like I said, he had little Augie's Paisano. He also had Sam Palaccia, Giuseppe Dotto, also known as Joe Adonis, and a young Albert Anastasia, fresh home from beating the electric chair. On July 8, 1923, Frankie attended a christening with his wife and two daughters. At 1 a.m. on the 9th, they were ready to leave. Frankie and Matteo Romano decided that they were going to walk. So Frankie asked his pal Frank Forte to take his wife and kids home. Matteo Romano gave him the keys to his car and Forte took the Yale women home. He dropped them off in front of the house. When they got out, he made a U-turn and headed back to the party. He only made it a few feet before a car pulled alongside and shots rang out. Five shots were fired. All five hit their mark and Frank Forte died instantly. The shooters peeled off into the night. Witnesses said that two of the shooters were Italian, about 5'5 five, five in height and smooth shaven. Yeah, that, that really narrowed it down. In 1924, Frankie's old pal Johnny Torrio needed help getting rid of a body. The problem was Dino Banyu was still using that body. Johnny made a call to Frankie, and it just so happened that Frankie was on his way to Chicago for a funeral. Mike Merlo of the Union Sicilian had lost his battle with cancer and gangsters from all over the country would be descending on Chicago to pay their respects. Frankie hopped on a steamer with Sam Palaccia and headed west. On the morning of November 10th, Dino Benya was in his flower shop preparing floral arrangements for Mike Merlo's funeral. He was expecting a busy day. Many people had placed their orders for arrangements, many of them gangsters. So he wasn't alone when three hard-faced men walked into his shop. When he reached his hand out to shake, Frankie grabbed it and held on, while Alberto Anselmi and John Scalise pulled revolvers and shots rang out. The killer twins left five slugs in Dino Banyan's body. Frankie and Palaccia were arrested in hell, but were released before the cops knew who they had. Frank and Sam jumped on the next thing smoking back to Brooklyn. Over the next few years, Frankie became one of the biggest bootleggers in New York. He supplied Al Capone, who was now in charge of everything in Chicago since Johnny Torrio retired back to New York after catching a bullet in the neck, courtesy of the North Side Gang. In 1927, Frankie was facing deportation. He tried to gain citizenship legally, but he was denied because of his criminal record. But he was able to remain in the States while he appealed. Maybe he should have gone home. 
because it was also in 1927 when things started to fall apart for Frankie. First, for some reason, he and Joe Masseria were not on the best of terms. And second, Frankie and Al Capone had a fallen out and Al's shipments began to get hijacked before they ever left Brooklyn. Al had a friend in Frankie's organization named James D'Amato. Al and James were arrested together in 1925 for the murder of Peg Lonigan. He asked D'Amato to spy on Frankie, but Frankie found out. On July 8, 1927, James D'Amato was seen talking to two men. Moments later, witnesses heard three shots rang out and ran to find James D'Amato in the gutter with bullet wounds in the neck, abdomen, and side. The two men, who moments earlier had been standing with D'Amato, were seen running up 4th Avenue to a waiting sedan. Capone had lost his spy, but not before he had gotten word that his suspicions were correct. Frankie had been stealing from him. Al informed Joe Masseria and Johnny Torrio of Frankie's offenses and got the okay to bump him off. But Al would buy his time. It would be almost a year to the day of D'Amato's death before Al got his payback. On July 1st, 1928, at around 4 p.m., Frankie kissed his wife and left their apartment at 1402 55th Street in a hurry. He jumped into his brand new car. His old car had been shot up a few weeks prior. He escaped, but his car didn't make it. Frankie was on the spot and he knew it. He had just received an urgent call from Anthony Carfano telling him to come quick. He was driving up Utrecht Street when he noticed a sedan tailing him. Frankie hit the gas and turned on the 44th Street. The car kept pace and tried to overtake Frankie, but he swerved and tried to run them into the curb. Children at play and mothers with baby carriages scrambled to get out of the way. And then shots rang out from pistols and a Thompson submachine gun. But one blast from a sawed-off shotgun blew a chunk off of the back of Frankie's head. He slumped at the wheel and lost control. He crashed into a row home at 923 44th Street. The black sedan with Illinois plates pulled alongside, and Fred Killer Burke pumped more bullets from a Thompson submachine gun into Frankie's body before peeling up 44th Street and disappearing. Frankie Yale died with his boots and his diamonds on. He had a 32 automatic in his pocket, $1,000 in cash and checks, a four carat diamond pinky ring, and a belt buckle set with 75 diamonds. Thousands of people came to see Brooklyn's Prince of Pals be laid to rest. Frankie's funeral would be the biggest the New York underworld had ever seen. Now, we remember Frankie as a ruthless killer, and he was that. But the people of Brooklyn saw Frankie as a Robin Hood, and many stories were told of his kind heart and generosity. And that, my friends, is the skinny on Francesco Iwali, Frankie Yale. I hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. Make sure that you bump off that subscribe button, ring that bell set for all notifications, break that thumb. If you want to join the gang, push that join button for two bucks a month. You could become an official made guy or gal. If you want to see the versions of the videos I can't show you on YouTube, go over to the Patreon channel, sign up over there. That way you can see all the videos with all the stuff that I can't show you on YouTube. All right. So listen, next week I got something good for you. And then I'm going to start doing some of these videos over over the next few, you know, next few months. I'm going to drop them you know, here and there. But I got something good. I'm working on something good for you guys. You guys have been asking for a long time. So give me a second and I'll have that for you. All right. So this has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I'll see you in the funnies. <laughs>